All right, so go ahead, open to Haggai chapter 2. We are going to finish up the book this morning. If you haven't been with us for the first three weeks of this series, Jackie just caught us up, okay? That's kind of what you need to know right there. Brought us through uh, where we are in Israel's story. So the people have come back from exile in Babylon, and they're rebuilding the city and especially rebuilding the temple. And Haggai, the prophet, is one of the ones who's encouraging them, making sure that they actually finish this rebuilding endeavor. So that's where we are as you're in Haggai 2. Now, um, if you saw the movie Shawshank Redemption, probably the, the most famous quote in that movie is when the main character uh, looks at his buddy Red and says, remember Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. And part of the reason why this quote is so memorable is because uh, it's unexpected, given the circumstances. <laughs> this guy, Andy's life, it's not gone as planned. He is not in a good place when he is saying this. And so it's startling almost to have this quote against that backdrop. And really, that's where we find ourselves this morning in our passage. We're in, so the last part of Haggai, the, the, the title of the sermon is A New Hope. As you would expect then, there will be some obligatory Star Wars references with a title like that. Has to be, right? So pay attention for those. But uh, we've got this new hope, even though things are not really going as planned. And Jackie just read for us, some of the men are crying, even though the, the foundation of the temple's finished, because it pales in comparison with its former glory, just like the nation of Israel pales in comparison with its former glory. And we spent a lot of time talking last week when Shane was preaching in week one, I know, talking about just how bad things have been going for the people of Israel. The harvests are poor. They're not doing well. So, so where is hope going to come from? It seems out of place, but as Paul David Tripp is fond of reminding us, uh, the doorway to hope is hopelessness. <laughs> seems really counterintuitive, but the doorway to hope is hopelessness. Uh, how does that work? It's because it, it, when we feel hopeless, uh, that's when our priorities shift. And we refocus, we recenter on what matters most. So we've really talked a lot in the last three weeks. We haven't used this phrase, but I think it sums it up nicely. We've talked about the, the grace of unmet expectations. The grace of unmet expectations where, again, the, the people in, in Haggai's time, they're going to the harvest, they're expecting 50 bushels, they only find 20. And that hardship causes them to refocus, reprioritize, ask the questions they need to be asking. And we might experience the same things in our lives. The grace of unmet expectations. And here Haggai's saying, look, embrace the grace. Embrace the grace. Let it lead you to hope. Let it be the doorway to your true hope because if you'd go that way, when you get there, it's going to be a, a biblical hope instead of, um, the, you know, the wishy-washy hope that most of us know today. And you see, for most of us, hope is dependent on circumstances. I mean, that's how we approach the whole concept of hope. I'll give you a, a silly example and a more serious one. So uh, I could say today, I am a hopeful that the Cubs will make the playoffs. And before the All-Star break, I'm not sure I could have said that. What's the difference? Well, they're playing well these days, and they weren't playing well earlier. You see, my hope is dependent on circumstances. That's a wishy-washy, unbiblical hope. Now, again, that's a silly example. Let's take something more serious. What about, what about parenting? I mean, most of us here either have or are or will uh, parent right, at some point. And so you know this experience where you have hope that your kids are going to turn out all right. It's fingers crossed kind of hope most of the time. But then what happens when behavior problems show up in the little kids? Or it gets more serious as they get older. And we're not just talking about behavior problems, but we're talking about life choices that are taking them in a very bad trajectory wandering from the faith, wandering from uh, so much of what, what you've tried to instill in them. And you see, your, your hope is now dependent on circumstances. My hope in my, in my children's future is based on how they're doing right then. But you see, that's not what biblical hope is. 
Biblical hope is not dependent on circumstances, but dependent on the promises of God alone. The promises of God alone. What he says he will do, he will do. That's, that's the lesson that Haggai has for us this morning. It's there at the top of your bulletin if you're taking notes. Our hope as the people of God is in his faithfulness, not our circumstances. Our hope as the people of God is in his faithfulness, not our circumstances. And in his faithfulness, God promises us many things, Three of them we we see today just in this one short passage that we're looking at. He promises us a new king, a new victory, and a new relationship. So let's look at each one in turn. So first of all, a new king. Haggai chapter two, hoping you're there by now. I'm gonna start verse 20, verses 20 and 21. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, where's the king? All right, I don't see it there. So what, hang on, we'll get there, okay? Uh, let me explain it. So first of all, just know that this is the second prophecy on the same day. Shane uh, preached earlier in Haggai 2 last week, same day, December 18th, 520 BC. Okay, historical moment. This is, a, this, is, this is true. This is historical stuff that we're talking about. And Haggai gets up, I don't know, in the morning or something and gives this kind of you know, sort of depressing oracle, really. If you, again, if you were here last week, it, it, it was a little bit hard. You, you can't make yourselves right because everything you touch is, is defiled. It's contaminated by your sins, so you can't fix your own relationship with God. There's a little bit of hopelessness there, right? But it leads us into true hope. God's gonna send someone to fix that for us. So we're leading us into hope, and in fact, we ended our passage last week with this line, the end of verse 19, from this day on I will bless you. There's a hope, and, and now Haggai, I don't know, again, maybe it's the afternoon or something, he gets back up and he says, let me unpack that for you a bit. I want to give you a, a future vision of how God is going to bless you. And the heart of that message is, verse 20, we're sorry, verse 21, that God is going to shake the heavens and the earth. He's gonna shake the heavens and the earth. Now, what exactly does that mean? You're doing Bible study and you're in this passage right here. Right? That's the phrase that you circle with a big question mark next to it and go, I gotta do some work here and figure out what this is talking about. You're hoping your study notes at the bottom will tell you something because otherwise you're confused because we'd probably have our own ideas of what shaking the heavens and the earth look like. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna bring in our ideas. We wanna know how God uses this language. So we're gonna look at it. Just notice though, before we figure out exactly what shake the, the heavens and the earth means, Means that this is a message given to Zerubbabel specifically. Tell Zerubbabel that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. This isn't for the whole nation of Israel. Who is Zerubbabel? We met him week one. We've talked about him a little bit. Besides having one of the better names in the Old Testament, who is he? He's, he's the governor of Judah, and he's in the line of David. Okay, so he's the heir to David's throne. And this message that Haggai has is for him specifically. Well, why? Because shaking the heavens and the earth, it's language that gets used throughout the Old Testament. It's not, uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it shows up in a few places for really earth-shaking events. I mean, something that's so new and so cool. I mean, we, we use the same kind of word today. We, we talk about something being groundbreaking, and that's what this is. This is Ground is being broken up. The earth is being shaken because of this momentous occasion. For example, it gets used of the Exodus. I mean, that's an earth-shaking event. You got the superpower in the world, Egypt, and two million of their slaves just kind of walk out of the nation without a fight. And in fact, the Egyptians are giving them gold to, to speed them on their way. Well, that's, that's something, especially when the Egyptian army is completely annihilated with uh, this group of people, again, not fighting back, but just sort of standing there dumbfounded. Okay, that's, that's an earth-shaking event. That's the way this language is used. And that's not what we're talking about here, though. The closest parallel to, to this phrase comes in 2 Samuel 22, verse 8. It'll be up on the screen for you. Where it says, The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the heavens shook. 
Okay, so this sounds like the sort of event we're talking about. What is the context for this, this line of poetry right here? And we go back up just a few verses to 2 Samuel 22, verse one. Here's the context. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. You know your Old Testament background? You know this is talking about, okay, David has finally ascended the throne. There's no one else keeping him from his rightful place as the ruler over Israel. So it's David's ascension to his throne and the establishment of his line, his dynasty, that's what was earth-shaking. Here's our promise then of a new king. I'm gonna shake the heavens and the earth just like I did when I brought David to the throne and we're going, okay, somebody else must be coming to the throne then. Somebody else must be coming to the throne. And and this is important because David's kingship, it was different than, say, Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, but Saul's a one-man dynasty. And God rips the kingdom away from him because of his unfaithfulness. And he gives it to David, but then he makes this promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, where he says, there's always gonna be somebody on your throne. Your line will endure forever. Really interesting context, too, given what we're talking about in Haggai, because God makes this promise when David says to him, I want to build you a house. Okay, I want to make the temple for you. And God says, no, that's not going to be your job. I'm going to give that job to your son Solomon. He's going to do that. Instead, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build your house, David. I'm going to build your dynasty. I'm going to give you this forever kingdom. So here, we're in Haggai, we're discussing God's house again, rebuilding the temple, and and God reminds his people of the promise that he made to his servant, David. And who's he saying it to? To Zerubbabel, David's heir. In the midst of all this hopelessness, he's going, look, do you see? There's still someone to sit on David's throne. Why are you feeling hopeless? There's Zerubbabel. This is the help us, Zerubbabel, you're our only hope moment. There's your obligatory Star Wars reference, all right? I'm done with them now. (laughs) There's still someone to sit on David's throne. God, through Haggai, is reminding his people of his promises, and he's saying, don't lose hope. Look at what I've done. You guys have been carted off into exile. There's still someone to sit on David's throne, and I'm going to do something still. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. This is not the end. There is more to come. And then he gives us a picture of what that more is. So let's keep reading the new victory, verse 22. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. So how are things gonna shake out, pun fully intended? Well, there's gonna be the overturning of kingdoms and the vanquishing of armies, you know, normal stuff. In other words, God is saying uh, total victory is promised. Not so much to the people of God, although we participate in it, but really to God himself. God will rule over all. The, The key word in verse 22 is thrones, thrones. We, we see thrones that, what are we talking about? We're talking about the, the world organized without reference to God. The world putting itself together, not paying any attention to God's existence. Maybe outright denying God's existence. You know, this is, this is somebody who's anti-God, just against the God of the Bible, but more likely these are people who just pay no notice. There's just no, no attention given to God, which is the height of folly. This is how the Bible defines foolishness living as if God didn't exist. Psalm 14, verse one, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's it, that's folly in a nutshell because the most important fact in the whole universe that God exists is denied. Of course, everything else is gonna be folly. So that's, that's thrones here, and, and these thrones, this is, again, people getting together to say, we're gonna form society, we're gonna live our own way. We're gonna be our own gods and and here's how we're gonna establish this. How does God respond? Uh, Here's Psalm two, verses two to four. Brings up the same exact theme. Should be up on the screen for you. The, The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's important, 
the anointed, that's the, the Messiah, is the, the word used there, Mashiach. So the anointed, who is the anointed? The king. So here we're, we're talking about David still, or David's heir. So they rise up against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles, which is, by the way, how we all feel. That's the default setting on our human heart. God never commands anything except what is for our good, and yet we're like petulant teenagers, right? So every command we're given just feels like a chain and a shackle. I want, I want my freedom, I want my autonomy. That's what the sin nature is right there in a nutshell. So we're gonna break their chains and throw off their shackles. How does God respond? The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, he just chuckles. This ain't gonna work, All right? The Lord is having none of it. The one enthroned, that's God. He is the one enthroned and all other thrones will fall, as we sang this morning. I feel like I should make a Game of Thrones reference here, but I haven't read it and I certainly haven't seen it, so you're gonna have to supply your own if you're a fan, but there you go. Now he goes on, he talks about horses and their riders and that whole reference, that's a, that's a call back to the Exodus. Where, where the Egyptian horses and their riders were vanquished, right? The people of God walk through on dry land and, and the water comes back and, and wipes out the Egyptian army. That's a, a good thing to remind us of because there's God's power on display. This is why the Lord can chuckle in the face of all worldly opposition because he's got the power. He will rule. He will rule over all. And this is important for us because I, I think it's so easy to get caught up in a, in a kind of historical or cultural snobbery. Our current situation always feels so big, doesn't it? You look at world powers and they're so impressive or you look at current circumstances and they feel so dire and so depression can set in or, or awe can set in. That's what it is. We, we're overawed at current situation. So in Haggai's time, you can only imagine the people of God right there, they're looking at Persia, the Persian Empire, it looks really impressive. The largest empire that the world had ever seen at that point. You can imagine them being overawed. But what happens to the Persian Empire? It falls. Alexander the Great comes along, he's like 30. You know, younger than I'm like, this is a pup, wipes it out. Like that's his 30th birthday present to himself. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna conquer the known world. Well, okay, now Alexander the Great seems really impressive, doesn't he? I don't know that anybody's done that, so this does feel pretty impressive. He doesn't even make it back home to Macedonia. Never even gets to sit on his throne. He's dead before he gets back. So much for impressive. Kingdom splits for a bit, and eh, there's just some confusion, then Rome comes up. Uh, has there ever been an empire like Rome? We still drive on the streets they made. Like, this was a good empire. Right up until it wasn't anymore. It gets sacked by barbarians, like a group of local thugs take over the greatest empire the world's ever known. Not so impressive. Fast forward a bit, the British Empire. Sun never sets on the British Empire, except it did, right? The US, sole superpower in the world. Clearly our influence is on the wane. China's on the ascendancy. Do you have any of that? Overawed by current geopolitical events? I think there's this, we can fret about current circumstances, about government realities. What, what's going on in the world? What happens if we're not the superpower anymore? What happens if, if there's another country that takes that place and they don't share our values and we, we get nervous? And look, that's just governments and empires. I mean, what about cultural movements and philosophies? And you can look around and go, morals are deteriorating and church attendance is declining and the influence of the church is waning. I mean, what do we do when you start to panic? Look, that's, it's, it's just unbiblical, unbiblical fear. The one enthroned, he just, he just laughs. He just laughs. We sang it as kids, didn't we? He's got the whole world in his hands going to be okay. It's under his control. Victory is assured. And the victory will come through God and God alone. And that's another really important reminder. Because look, maybe half of us have this unbiblical fear where we're fretting about geopolitical realities. There's the other half of us that have an unbiblical hope. Because we put a false hope in a false God. 
everybody needs a God. We all worship something, we all put our trust in something, whatever it is. And for us today, in our culture here in the States, look, it's politics. Right? That's where the trust is, which is why we don't have a political divide, we have religious wars going on in our country. The political left and the political right. This is religion, that's why people are so amped up about it. And you can put unbiblical hope in a false God. Why do we have the, the rise of all these nationalist movements across the globe? So we put our hope in a flag. It's a really dumb thing to put your hope in, by the way. We get political messiahs. These aren't great leaders anymore, they're messiahs. Look, Obama was a messiah to the political left. He wasn't worthy of that trust. Trump is a messiah to the nationalist right. Not worthy of that trust. But this is where we go. And so you, you start to think, well, if we just got the right person elected or the right majority and the right part of the Congress, if, if we just got this case overturned or this law put into place, if Christians could just get back in some positions of influence and culture, everything would be all right. Our hope is in the wrong places. Our hope is in God, the only one worthy of that type of trust. God promises here to set all things right, but in his time and in his way, and most importantly, through his king. Now, as we turn to the last section, I want to read just a snippet of uh, Alec Motyer's commentary on Haggai. He's got this wonderful picture of where we go just to, to wrap up the book. He says this, he says, the final verses of his book reveal Haggai as the literary equivalent of an impressionist painter. He gives general tone and effect without elaborate detail. His colors are the thunderstorm, the earthquake, revolution, clashing armies, and civil conflict. As in a carefully composed picture, where every stroke is designed to, to lead the eye to what is central, so here, too, the focus is like a, a shaft of sunlight illuminating one item, a ring shining on a finger. So let's keep reading here, the new relationship, verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So here's God speaking to Zerubbabel again, and he's saying, big things, I will take you and I'll make you like my signet ring. I have chosen you. There are these incredible promises spoken to this messianic figure. Again, what's a messiah? Someone who's anointed, that's what the word means, and the king is the anointed one. So he's not the capital M messiah, but it starts to feel like it in this passage. I mean, these are big promises. Now, we don't do signet rings today, so we're gonna have to unpack that some. What is a, a signet ring exactly? This is the, the ring that had the royal seal on it. And so, if you were wearing it, if you had it in your possession, it identified you with royalty. It, it tells you who you are. If the king gave that ring to somebody and they, they carried it around with them, they, they spoke in the place of the king. They had his authority. They were closely identified with him. And then this is the ring, of course, that's used to, to seal. So you, you sign something into law, you, you put some wax on the bottom, and you stamp your ring into it. It's got the royal seal on it. That's how the ring was used. Now, we don't talk about using the ring in this passage. It's the wearing of the ring that matters. And so this is uh, the enjoyment of this close relationship. Uh, the, the, the seal of the king Right there, God's saying, I'm, I'm gonna wear you like a signet ring. You're gonna be the, the seal. You're gonna be how I'm known in the world. Where do we get this language? Where do we see it uh, most famously in the Old Testament? It's Song of Songs. It was about marriage. And here's this famous passage that, it, I mean, I've used this text at weddings before. It says, the, the woman, and she's pleading with her beloved, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. And what's the seal? It's the ring. She's talking about a signet ring here. 
this lover, she wants her name engraved on her beloved's heart and arm as this symbol to say, I want to know that I am central to your affections and I have the first call on your strength. And so here, God has placed his name on his, on his chosen king, wearing Zerubbabel like a seal, the closest identification. This king will be how God is known. And that's why we get this strong choosing language. I, I have chosen you. I will take you. It almost sounds like a wedding, doesn't it? I will take you as my bride. And that's kind of what we say in the wedding vows. And, and here it is. This is even more wonderful. If you were in Haggai's audience, I mean, this would be really good news. Because God has talked about signet rings and, and heirs of David before, right as they're getting sent off into exile. So this is what God says to another son of David, one of Zerubbabel's grandfathers, and says um, through his prophet Jeremiah, and it's not so good. So here is Jeremiah 22, verse 24. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would still pull you off. If what he's saying is Rebbe Bell sounds like a wedding, this sounds like a divorce. No more identification. Okay, we're, we're, we're done here. Is, is this the end of the promise? Does this mean that the line of David no longer gets to have this, this forever dynasty? Well, here we, we learn, as God speaks through his prophet Haggai, no, that was just a pause. It was just a pause. The promise is still in effect. The promises to David still stand and they're repeated to Zerubbabel. But who is Zerubbabel exactly? I mean, who is this guy? Look, he's not the most impressive guy, which is why we don't know him. He does not usher in a return to Israel's former glory. He doesn't throw off the Persian yoke and establish Israel as its own nation again. Look, God makes this promise to him, and yet there is no throne for him to mount, no crown for him to wear, and no empire for him to rule. It's just an empty title that he's got. He, he's, he's the titular head of a backwater province of a really impressive empire. So, so hear me clearly. Look, when, when this promise is made to Zerubbabel, precisely nothing changes. Absolutely nothing changes for him or his people. And isn't that how it often feels? You ever read the Bible looking for God's promises, desperate for God's promises only to be left despairing because you wake up and the struggle with sin is still continuing and the marriage is still crumbling, unemployment is still drudging on, whatever the case may be. And you go, where is God? Why isn't he moving in this situation? I feel like I'm left with nothing but his word, just like Zerubbabel. That's all he's got, is this promise that is made. Nothing else changes. But remember, hope is a good thing, maybe even the best of things. So let's keep going. This is the end of Haggai, but let's just keep going. Let's see what happens in the rest of Zerubbabel's story. He doesn't ever really rule over Israel, but he has a son, at least. His son's name is Abihud. You heard of him? Nope, hadn't either. Had to look it up. Well, Abihud has a son. His name is Eliakim, who has a son named Azor, who has a son named Zadok. Still nothing. None of these names sound good, still not right. They're just trading which state they're a vassal of at this point. That's all, just changing subservience to foreign powers. Zadok has a son named Achim. Achim has a son named Elihud, son named Eleazar, son named Matan, son named Jacob. How about Jacob? Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. That's how the Gospel of Matthew begins. You see, the, the, we get to the true signet ring, uh, the one that we were waiting for. The intimacy and the, the dignity and the royalty, the authority of the signet ring, they belong not just to the son of David, but to the son of God. Haggai says to Zerubbabel, says God, God says, I have chosen you. Well, Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, he's mocked as 
the chosen of God. Here is the king, the true son of David through whom God will establish his forever kingdom here on earth. What does that do to our hope? That changes everything about our hope because we know uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter one, all of God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. That's the, the fulfillment and the guarantee of these promises. You see, in, in contrast to Zerubbabel, we don't just have uh, the word spoken, but we have the word made flesh and crucified and raised again to new life as the first fruits of the coming age. And all of a sudden, God's promises, they seem completely assured because they are guaranteed by the very blood of Christ. That struggle with sin, that will end. Those whom God has laid on your heart, they will be saved. That marriage that's crumbling can be healed. I mean, if God raised Christ from the dead, can't he bring healing to that marriage? Yes. Our trouble is with the timeline, isn't it always? The promises given to Zerubbabel, we have 10 generations recorded, 550 years until Christ hangs on a cross as fulfillment of that promise, raised a new life. Even then, of course, it doesn't look like the forever kingdom is ushered in. It's like a mustard seed. It's just been planted. We're still waiting. Our trouble is with the timeline. And, and how long for us with these promises that we read? It's why we sing songs like Even So Come, because there's this desperation in us. We're ready for the forever kingdom. It makes me think of a story uh, from George Muller's life. A great man of faith, his prayer warrior, he shared this at one point near the end of his life. He said, I have been praying for 63 years and eight months for one man's conversion. He is not saved yet, but he will be. How can it be otherwise? I am praying. You see, he knew God had laid this person on his heart, so he had assurance this man would be saved. Decade after decade, after decade. And you want to know something? Muller died, and the man was not saved. How's was that for a blow to your faith? And so they lowered Muller's casket into the ground. And the friend cried out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's just like God, isn't it? <laughs> like, seriously, you couldn't have done this one week earlier? I could have seen it. I could have gone to my grave rejoicing. I've been praying for some of my family for 22 years now. I'm a third of the way there. If it takes that, then hey, may God take me first so they have that opportunity, right? We think in terms of time and circumstances. Oh, we almost can't help it. We're so finite. We're so bound by our location. We think in terms of time and circumstances instead of placing our hope in God's faithfulness to his word. So how do we cultivate that sort of biblical hope, resolute trust in God's promises? Well, we gotta read the word. You gotta know what the promises are. That's where it starts. You gotta, you gotta know this book thoroughly and deeply, but here's the thing. You, you read the word, but you gotta make sure you're looking to the Savior who is revealed in that word because that's where our confidence is, is found. I think the problem we have with the promises of God is when we read the Bible topically, which we do. You'll notice, by the way, this is not a topical Bible. That's not how God arranged it, and he's the all-wise, all-knowing God of the universe. He knew what he was doing. So you buy these little precious promise books that they make, and, and you go, okay, uh, we'll take an example. So uh, I'm struggling with unemployment. It's been, it's been dragging on. Finances are starting to hurt. So you open up this little book and you go to the promises about money and you start reading there and the promises aren't fulfilled and, and that's when despair starts to, to set in and doubt starts to set in. If you read the Bible topically, you're never going to understand the Bible because it isn't a topical Bible. The, the, the Bible is a grand story of redemption and you have to set every promise within its context within that story of redemption. 
I mean, why didn't Zerubbabel restore Israel to their former glory? They got this promise, but that's not Zerubbabel's place in the grand story. Zerubbabel was just a, a shadow, a hint of the forever king who was coming and in whom the promise would be fulfilled. You know what this looks like? Let me give you some examples. I'm gonna mess up two of your favorite verses right here. So you're struggling with, with what's keep going with the unemployment thing, financial woes, something like that. And so you come to Jeremiah 29, 11. We love that verse. Somebody here has got that on a plaque in their house. I'm sure of it. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to prosper you. Ooh, I like that word. And so you, you cling, I gotta claim that promise. That promise isn't for you, not like that. It's not talking about your employment. Remember, this is Jeremiah. We already talked about Jeremiah. This is the, a promise that Jeremiah is speaking to the people of God as they're being sent into exile, into captivity in Babylon. And he's saying, you know what? Build houses in Babylon. Start a business. Plant an orchard because you're gonna get to eat its fruit. You're gonna be there for a while in circumstances that you don't like. But I have plans for you. They're plans for hope and for future. I'm gonna bring you back from exile. Under Zerubbabel, by the way, I'm gonna bring you back to Israel. I'm gonna restore Israel as a nation and Messiah will come through that nation. That's the hope, that's the promise we have, which means, yeah, we can trust. No matter our circumstances, God does have a hope and a future for us. They're called glory, the new heavens and the new earth. That is a promise we can cling to. Here's another one, Philippians 4.13. Somebody else has this on a plaque in their house. Every athlete's favorite verse. I'll never understand this. This has nothing to do with athletics, but there you go. In fact, I just read this week, there's a prominent NBA player who says this is his mantra, which is, by the way, a weird word to use for a biblical passage, but that's a separate story. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so you read that and you go, I, I, can, I, I can start on this, this venture. I can, I can launch a new business or I can, I can win an NBA title. I can, I can flap my wings and fly. I don't know what the promise is. It's got a context. It's got a place in the grand story. This one actually is a good one when it comes to money, in fact. Because right before it, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, in abundance and in poverty, abject poverty. And here's the secret. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If I have Jesus, I have everything. And I may perish in poverty, the richest man alive, because I have Jesus. There's the grand story. It's always gonna take us back to Jesus. If we have Jesus, we have everything. Jesus, who is God's signet ring. God wears him like a seal on his heart and on his arm. And if we put our faith in Jesus, the Bible is very clear. We are found in him. My identity is in Christ. You know what that means? It means God wears me like a seal on his heart and on his arm, central to his affections, with the first call on his strength. That's where our hope is found. And it is an unshakable hope, no matter the circumstances, no matter the timeline, because we know the God who will shake the heavens and the earth once more as Christ ascends his forever throne. Let's pray. Lord, help us to put our hope in you and in you alone. Your promises are spectacular. Every confidence is found in your word, rightly read, rightly understood, and understood through the lens of Christ, your promised Messiah, your forever King. Lord, help us to look to him, not our circumstances, not the timeline, but to how you have fulfilled every promise through his blood, raising him to the newness of life to which we will be raised also if our hope is in you if our faith is in him and his finished work on the cross in our behalf. Lord, give us a hope that is unshakable in a God who is unchanging and whose promises are guaranteed in Christ. Amen and amen.